Welcome to a new series on the Seminary Channel, Books in Review. Today for our very first book, it's really a short one, more of a pamphlet, The Unicum Issue and the Honor of God by Father Francisco Ricosa. This is a translation done by a new publishing house called Shield of Faith Press, and it's with a foreword by Bishop Donald Sanborn of the Institute. So, Your Excellency, as with as we, we hope to do in this series, we can't go through the whole book, we can't summarize the whole book, but what I'd like to do is pick a few passages and, and have you comment on them. And one of the first things that Father Ricosa brings up is the idea that this doesn't interest some lay people. So I am speaking about believers, faithful people. Moreover, I am talking about those who want to stay faithful to tradition, as we say. But even those people, not all, thank God, but a large part, are, so to speak, influenced by their modern mentality. This mentality insists on putting man before God. The things that pertain to man, that interest him, he places before the things that pertain to God. I will give you an example that is not pertinent to the unicum issue, but to the Mass. If, for example, you were to ask the practicing faithful, who are just coming out of Mass, what is the most important part of the Mass, a lot of those who attend the Novus Ordo will say, the Gospel, or the Sermon. And this is actually very Lutheran. Others, more devout, more Catholic, will say communion. But what is the correct answer? The consecration, because the Mass is a sacrifice. As you know, the Eucharist is both a sacrament and a sacrifice. Sacrament as we receive it in Holy Communion, and as it perpetuates the real presence in the tabernacle. Sacrifice as it is offered on the altars, precisely during the Holy Mass. But communion, as holy as it is, it is one of the holiest and most beautiful things ever, is for man. The sacrifice is also for man, but to whom is it offered? To God. Indeed, the first goal of the sacrifice, the most important one, is latria, that is to say, the adoration of God. Yes, he's referring to uh, what he says is a modern mentality. Also, I would um, uh, say perhaps the influence of Protestantism, and that is that the the Mass is a type of... Um, uh, how would you say, devotional experience that uh, whereby we give to God our devotion, something like going to um, a Miraculous Medal uh, devotions or Our Lady of Perpetual Help devotions, where all of the activity is from you. So it's, it's, uh, and that you go there to, to partake in this and you feel good about doing it. Uh, and I'm not knocking that at all. I mean, I'm not trying to, but the, the there's certainly a place for that in the church. But the the uh, the mass is a whole other thing. The mass is the sacrifice which is offered by Christ Himself. He is the principal priest at the mass. That's the, co the Council of Trent, and it is the reenactment of the sacrifice of Calvary. It is the sacrifice that is offered by the entire church. Uh, by ultimately the head of the entire church, our Lord Jesus Christ himself. Uh, and it is for the uh, purpose of primarily pleasing God and also making reparation for our sins. It is the source of all of the actual graces in the world. So the yes, the central part of it is the consecration. And our participation in it is the offering of our personal sacrifices and ultimately all of our good works uh, as part of the sacrifice that is offered by Christ of his own body and blood. So we attach our, our own little sacrifices to his great sacrifice. That is the Catholic idea of the sacrifice of the Mass. Holy Communion, first of all, the only Holy Communion that is officially part of the Mass is the communion of the priest. See, so even if he doesn't distribute communion for one reason or another, the Mass is complete because he has participated in the sacrifice. This goes back to the Old Testament. When the animals were sacrificed, uh, they would be, uh, parts of the animals would be given to the priests to eat uh, as, as a participation, a sign of participation in that sacrifice. Uh, so, but Commonly, uh, the faithful do receive Holy Communion at this time. So uh, he's saying the, the entire focus of the Church in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass is toward the honor and glory of God, the adoration of God, latria, that's what that means, the adoration of God. 
It is for God. It is not for us. <laughs> you see, it's not something that uh, I need to get something out of, or, or uh, it, it is entirely God-centered. Uh, uh, that's, that's what the point that he's making. Mm -hmm. And and strictly speaking, the sermon, the communion of the faithful, these are actually interruptions of the Mass. In a way, the communion of the faithful, I wouldn't call it an interruption, but it is not an essential part of the Mass. It, uh, authors say if there's a great number of people to receive communion, the, it could be distributed after Mass. So he said, and that's why there's this second confidior, that is, it is a, a communion service, you might say, that is in, in, in placed inside the Mass, and that's why the altar boy has to say, again, the confidior uh, representing the people because they are going to receive communion at this point, you see. So, uh, the, the, uh, so the, uh, it, but the uh, sermon certainly is not part of the Mass. It, it is, as a matter of fact, you might notice that the priest takes his maniple off, showing that this is something exterior to the Mass, and in some cases will take even the chasuble off. I saw Father Chikata do that frequently yes. up in Milwaukee. Yes, that is uh, something that is not necess not absolutely prescribed, but it is it was a custom, it is that the sermon is entirely separate. As a matter of fact, you could give the sermon in your cassock, uh, or a stole and uh, as uh, surplus and stole before mass for some reason. Uh, was that your experience growing up? No, no. They always gave the sermon uh, right where it is after the gospel. But you know, for one reason or another, you could give it uh, at different times. You know, there's the um, it, there's no it's nothing rubrically set about it. You see, so um, uh, so yes, it's it's the sermon is is accidental to the mass. I think what's great about why Father Percosa brings this up is the question is, well, why are you going to Mass? And if people say, well, I want to hear a sermon, or I need to receive communion, these are not the reasons to go to Mass primarily. They, they, as you say, they are secondary. The main reason is I want to go and adore God because it's my duty, and, and I'm told to do so by our Lord and by the Church. Yes. And if that is your primary starting point, then you can enter into the unicum question more seriously. But if it's, well, I need to receive, the, the, always I hear the the argument, I need to receive sacraments. Right. Well, if that's the primary reason you're going to Mass, that's not the primary goal of the Mass. Because you can receive sacraments outside of the Mass, including Holy Communion. Another reason why the unicum issue doesn't interest a majority of faithful is that, as all questions relative to religion, even if they can be perceived in an elementary manner by the most simple people, by common sense and a spirit of faith, Developing them requires a certain formation concerning complex matters, a formation that, of course, a lot of faithful do not have. <gasps> Are we saying that you can't just look up a few things on the internet and make theological pronouncements, Your Excellency? No, uh, the, no. There, this it's a, a f unfortunate in these times that where we are deprived of the magisterium of the church and also the work of theologians, etc., and the all of the instruction given by priests that lay people are left to their own lights to, to figure out things. And, and many times they make errors. Uh, they just don't understand. And uh, they, they, theology is a very, very difficult science. And you have to train many years to, to think theologically and to explore. And you also have to have a knowledge of Latin and sometimes of Greek and various other uh, tools in order to research and find out what, what is what, you know. so. But today, as I said, it's it's as if an atomic bomb has gone off, and we're just searching for something to eat. <laughs> so. uh, Father Rocosa gives an episode here about Cardinal Sapers. I wouldn't use the term interrogation, but questioning of Archbishop Lefebvre. And this interrogation was published in French first, then in Italian, in a book called Monsignor Lefebvre e il Santificio. Cardinal Saper asked Archbishop Lefebvre, do you hold that a faithful Catholic can think and assert that a sacramental rite, especially the one of the Mass and then also the others, approved and promulgated by the Holy Father, might not be in accordance with the faith or favens heresim, that is to say, favors heresy? To this question, Archbishop Lefebvre did not answer. He said, I do not know who promulgated it. How in the world could he not know who promulgated it? The signature was one of Paul VI. Everybody knew it. He knew it too. But why did he not answer the question? He could only answer two things. One, I do not have the ideas that you attribute to me. 
Therefore, I do not think that the new missal and the liturgical reform approved and promulgated by Pope Paul VI could contain something contrary to the faith or favoring heresy. No, I do not think that. But if on the, on, on the contrary, Archbishop Lefebvre had stated what he was really thinking, namely that this rite, even if promulgated by the one he recognized as Pope, is favoring heresy, then Cardinal Saper would have replied to him that such a statement is contrary to the faith. Why? Because the church magisterium teaches, and Archbishop Lefebvre knew it well, that's why he did not answer, that a rite promulgated by the universal church for all Catholics cannot be bad. That's the indefectibility of the church uh, in, in disciplinary matters, that it, it cannot prescribe something that would be sinful or which would lead to sin or heresy or uh, s some reforms might be better than others. Uh, you know, the, as a, uh, the church is not uh, protected from the point of view of prudence in the sense that it could uh, make some decisions which later it rescinds with regard to the you know, the best way to say mass or certain rubrics. or All of that is possible, but it can never prescribe something that would be sinful or leading to heresy or something that would be scandalous or bad, you see, in that sense. Uh, and uh, so, yes, the question was very clever on the part of Cardinal Saper, and the response of Archbishop Lefebvre was a disaster, frankly. That's where he should have said what he really thought, that it does favor heresy, and this is why we won't say it. And he should have drawn the conclusion there, namely that it is impossible, therefore, that Paul VI be a true pope. That's, that was the correct answer to that. And yes, they would have, you know, he would have set the whole holy office on fire with that answer, but nonetheless, that was the correct answer. But he pulled back from it, which I think was... Uh, he chose the path of diplomacy? Diplomacy. Diplomacy was his, his Achilles heel. You know, he was a great man and very courageous, very pious. He had deep faith, uh, Catholic faith. But he had this, this habit of diplomacy, that you can achieve things through diplomacy. And diplomacy and the faith generally don't get along. I mean, all of the chorus of martyrs <laughs> shows that diplomacy <laughs> and faith don't get along. There are times when, when diplomacy uh, doesn't work. Because in diplomacy, in order to obtain something, you must give something away. That's the general principle. You can't give away anything in the faith, not mm -hmm. a single iota. You know, so uh, I, I think that was a, a watershed moment for Archbishop Lefebvre, where he chose the path of diplomacy and neglected that, that opportunity to be a martyr, really. And that also led to that, that whole conspiracy theory of, well, it wasn't properly promulgated, therefore it's not yes. valid, etc. Come on. You know, it just, you know, the... the the T's were not crossed and the I's were not dotted, therefore it was not properly promulgated. That is really just a lot of nonsense. On the lot of nonsense thread, there was this idea that the unicum is praying for that individual. And well, I, you know, we pray for the Pope. And Bishop Gerard deals with this objection here. Father, Father Ricosa is quoting him. Um, well, see that one person who, despite being a traditionalist, tries to say, but we can cite a pope even if he is a bad one, even if he does not teach the Catholic truths, without ourselves being compromised by the things he says, because we do nothing but pray for him. And this is actually what Archbishop Lefebvre used to say. We expel from the society people who refuse to pray for the pope. For who can refuse to pray for the pope? Father Gerard at that time replies to him, as for myself, I always pray for John Paul II. But we must not pray for him at the Te Igitur, namely at the beginning of the canon, in which we pray for the Pope as a Pope, but rather in the memento, in which we pray for all the faithful and possibly also for the conversion of those who are not among the faithful. But in the Te Igitur, that is to say, at the beginning of the canon, where we pray for the Pope, the Bishop, and the Church, together with all the faithful Catholic, Apostolic, and Orthodox believers, namely those who possess the true faith, I say it again, we must not. Yes, the key word, no matter what interpretation you want to put on unicum, whether we're praying with, uh, you know, because unicum means together with, or you just want to say we're praying for the Pope and for the bishop, there are various interpretations. You read the authors, they, some say they're praying for them, some say we're, we're praying with them. It doesn't matter. The key word there is papa. 
if you if we if you just said we pray for Francis, but you didn't say Pope, you see, then but then, well you shouldn't do that. But I'm saying that the key word is Pope, our Pope, our Bishop. That means hierarchy. They are members of the hierarchy, and therefore, implicitly, you're saying everything that they have promulgated to the universal church is legitimate, right, and good. And if you are saying the traditional mass outside of their jurisdiction and against their will, you are condemning yourself at that point because the mass must be associated with the Catholic hierarchy. The, the level of contradiction necessary, Your Excellency, to, to go through with this at this point, yeah, because a lot of people will say, well, you know, I'm, they, they use this argument, I'm praying for him, etc. That I'm going to go back to a Bishop Sanborn transportation analogy. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to get on a flight that goes to Berlin. I stand up and say, I do not consent that this flight goes to Berlin. People don't realize because they're not the ones saying the words, the priest is saying the words. But the point is that just because you're not saying the words doesn't mean that you're not associating yourself with everything the priest is saying. There's no opt out in the mass. Well, I'm going to opt out of uh, Father's memento because I don't like who he's praying for today. Or I'm going to opt out for the memento for the dead because I don't have any dead people to pray for. This, this idea is crazy that you can... You, I don't associate myself with this part of the Mass because Father is unicum, and I'm not unicum. No, the only way that a Catholic can offer the sacrifice is through the priest. Pope, Pope Pius XII said that explicitly, that you are incapable of offering a sacrifice to God except through the priest at the altar. So if you are actively participating, that is, you go to Mass saying, this is my Sunday Mass and I, this is how I'm worshiping God today, that's active participation, you are doing and saying implicitly everything that he is doing and saying. If he is unicum, you are unicum. If you're merely passively participating, that is sitting there watching as if a movie and saying, I really, uh, is, you know, you go to a, a wedding, a Nova Sword or wedding or something like that, uh, and, and you're passively participating, then it's, you're not offering anything to God, you're just watching something. That's a whole different story. But people who try to justify going to Unicum Masses say that, well, I don't agree with Unicum, but I, I need the sacraments, I'm, I'm going there, you see. And uh, uh, they have all sorts of explanations. I've seen uh, all ways of trying to wriggle out of the problem. But it is, a, it is a central problem. The Mass cannot be disassociated from the hierarchy of the Catholic Church. And either those men are true popes and true bishops, or they're not. There is no gray area between those two things, and therefore, either you have to be unicum with them or not. There's nothing in between. Well, at in illo tempore, you were an opinionist on this on this yes. issue. Yes. And as you have, as your thinking has developed, and as you've you've written and and spoken to people about it, what is your sense among the faithful? Do you feel that over time more people are understanding the the realities behind the unicum issue, or that it's just it stayed the same. I think some people are. Uh, no, I think there's more of an awareness about it, but I think that because the Society of St. Pius X, which is, professes to be unicum and are their unicum, because they control most of the traditional masses in any given country, and they're everywhere, and they have, uh, they have uh, sort of reproduced the entire life of the church with various schools and religious orders and whatnot, people want that. And they manage to convince themselves of the legitimacy of being unicum. So I think they block it out. They, well, you know, I need this and we're here, we're, we've moved to this place and I have a job here, what can I do? We can't do anything, so we'll just have to go along with unicum. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of that, you know, I think if they were not in that situation, they would they would understand it better. One of the I think the silliest arguments I've I've heard in the past is you want to eliminate the competitors, and uh, Father Rocosa addresses this. Someone would say, "I understand, Father, all you've explained to me that's very nice, but you're just saying you can only go to my mass. It is to eliminate the competitors. No, it is no such thing. For if there were dozens, hundreds, thousands, millions of priests celebrating non unicum, I would be the happiest man in the world." 
I would spare an incredible amount of fuel, a great number of trips, so many toll fees, a lot of fatigue, and of course the world would be much better and the situation of the church would be much happier, so it would make me very happy. We do not ask for anything but that, and I would even say I ask nothing but to celebrate the Mass Unicum, that is to say I ask nothing but for the church to go back to normal, that God in his mercy gives us a legitimate pope, not only in potency but in act, and that eliminating all the errors that spread more and more to the great dishonor of the church, he restores the truth in the church. The church is always in the truth, but let him throw out from her the modernist and denounce and condemn the modern errors." Yes, I perfectly agree with that. We would uh, save a lot on airfare, and you know he travels all over Italy. No, the also in a, in a greater aspect, you know, if SSPX Society of Saint Pius X went non unicum and said that man is not the Pope, that would begin to put a tremendous pressure on the Novus Ordo to, as we see now, as as Bergoglio gets crazier and crazier a pressure to do something about this papal problem. In other words, that there is, Rome is occupied by people who are not Catholics. And, but, you know, SSPX taking that position, well, we're one with the Pope and Francis is our Pope, it, it gives a complacency that somehow we are able to live with Vatican II and all of this heresy and degradation and deterioration of the Catholic faith. Somehow we're going to call that Catholicism and we're looking for a little niche in this thing. Uh, that, that's, it is, it is, the, the real solution is to get these people out of the Vatican and put somebody Catholic there. That's the solution. It's not living with Vatican II. We can't live with Vatican II. See, uh, so yes, uh, it, it makes very clear the, the lines of battle. The unicum makes it very clear. Pre-Vatican II Catholicism is true Catholicism. Novus Ordo Catholicism is false Catholicism. And, and the, the, the flag of that is unicum or not. In other words, if you're not unicum, you're on the one side. If you are unicum, then you're saying implicitly, that Vatican II Catholicism is a form of Catholicism. It's like the extraordinary form of the Mass. Remember that? You know, the ordinary form is the new, and the extraordinary is the old. We can't live with that. That is not a solution. And many Catholics are just searching for peace in the Church. We'll live with Vatican II. Somehow we'll... we'll yeah, and they had a hope under Benedict XVI that somehow these two things can live together. They can't live together. And unicum is the is the center of that. To to summarize the, the our discussion, you're actually the Shield of Faith Press. Uh, it's a collaboration between an Englishman and a Frenchman, mm -hmm. which I think shows that those two nations have the faith. It, when they have the faith, they can cooperate together, even though naturally speaking, they have a lot of shall we say challenges. Yes. <laughs> the church is universal. It, it it transcends all national divisions and languages and everything. It's universal, and I think some uh, maybe Europeans should understand that. <laughs> <laughs> and and to that end, this was an ori originally a conference given in Milan by Father Ricosa, obviously in Italian, was translated into French by the the Sisters of Christ the King, and then was translated into English by by and and laid out here. So we're looking forward to seeing more publications from Shield of Faith Press. We'll bring some of the Italian and French works that you've had a chance to read in the past, Rex, and see to the English speaking world. And if you'd like to buy the book and support their work, there'll be a link in the video description. But in the meantime, thank you for taking the time to not only to write the, the forward for this, but to talk about this important issue, Your Excellency. Thank you.